Well, I'll start by saying, uh, Andreas, I'm, I'm delighted to be here uh, this afternoon. Uh, I remember fondly all the time we interacted in 1984 uh, with you and your wife uh, when you were in Grenoble. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge the unbelievable uh, effort you went through to uh, work with Jim Gray to get the Bible of Transaction Processing uh, actually published. So I'm delighted to, to know you and I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, what I want to talk about is the 800-pound gorilla. The, uh, as you all know, uh, big data is, is the buzzword, it's a marketing term. Somebody invented uh, the word to talk about what we've all been doing for a long, long time. Uh, so I'll first say uh, what, what, what it means to me. And uh, we have the second slide. So, most people agree that big, if you have a big data problem, uh, you have one of three uh, issues. Uh, they all start with B. So you either have a volume problem, you've got too much data and you're having trouble managing it all, uh, or you've got a velocity problem if your data is coming at you too fast and you're having a hard time keeping up, or if you have a variety problem which is it's coming at you from too many places and you have a data integration problem. Is that the next slide? So just briefly, uh, people who have a volume problem, uh, in my opinion, uh, if you want to do standard SQL analytics, standard business, business intelligence, uh, standard data warehouse stuff, uh, I know of 20 or 30 petascale uh, head of scale production data warehouses from multiple vendors running on hundreds of nodes uh, you know, in production day in, day out. So if, if this is what you want to do, uh, business intelligence on petabytes, uh, go get a data warehouse product. Uh, make sure it's a column store because they're way faster than row stores. And, uh, but I'm going to say, there are, there are lots of success stories of people who are, you know, making a go at uh, business intelligence on petabytes. But in my opinion, this, this, is, this is old news. This is yesterday's issue. Next slide. Uh, most everyone is predicting that data science will replace business intelligence. Uh, as soon as we can train enough data scientists and the basic uh, idea is that if you run a business intelligence query, you get a collection, you get a table of numbers. Uh, if you get a data science type to uh, look at your problem, it'll give you a predictive model. Would you rather have a predictive model or a table of numbers? Uh, any business guy would say, give me the predictive model. So uh, in my opinion, there's going to be a complete transformation of this space uh, and data science is just going to replace this intelligence. Uh, presumably by all the business analysts retiring uh, and getting replaced by uh, scientists who have the knowledge, necessary knowledge of statistics and machine learning. So this is the world of the quants. Uh, and the analytics that people want to do, predictive modeling, regression, uh, K nearest neighbor, dot, 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 dot. Most of this stuff is defined on arrays in linear algebra. So it's codes in linear algebra, uh, which are uh, sequences of basic building blocks, things like matrix multiply, things like singular value decomposition, things like eigenvectors, et cetera. So to me, the really interesting volume question very quickly is going to be, how are we going to do data management and this sort of analytics? So if you look at what a data scientist does, he does some data management to figure out what he wants to do analytics on, and he does some analytics, and he does this in a, you know iterative manner until he gets tired or solves his problem. So how to integrate uh, data, you know, analytics, this sort of analytics with data management is a really big issue. Lots of people are working on this. 
do you want a separate stat package like uh, is true in Spark or like is true in R? Uh, do you want to run a relational DBMS and then uh, cast everything to an array and run some sort of array package as user-defined function? Do you want to run an array database system like RAS Demand or CyDB? In my opinion, sorting all of this out is a 100-pound gorilla. So this is a really interesting, interesting issue, but it's only a 100-pound gorilla. So let's switch to the second B, which is the velocity problem. Uh, here, uh, the data is coming at you too fast. And either you want to do stream processing, and there are a whole bunch of complex event processing systems, so-called CEP. Uh, this stuff has been around for a decade. Uh, you know, Streambase and others did it a decade ago. More recently, there are open source systems like Storm and Kafka. Uh, in this case, if you want to process a million messages a second, uh, these systems are perfectly capable of doing it. Uh, the other way people think of the velocity problem is if you really, really don't want to lose a message and you uh, and every message is really a transaction that has to be persistent, well then you want a uh, high performance OLTP where a message is equal to a transaction and there are a bunch of new SQL systems like VoltDB, MetaSQL, who are perfectly capable of doing a million messages a second. So I don't know of a whole lot of people who want to go faster than a million <coughs> messages a second. Uh, I'm sure I'll be proven wrong at some point, but right now, current commercial products are doing okay in this space. Uh, there are some interesting issues, which is, uh, how to get multi-node transactions to run at a million uh, transactions a second. So there are some interesting issues, that, but I think they're, they're sort of around the fringes of the basic problem, which in my opinion is a 50-pound gorilla, which is something interesting to work on, but certainly not an 800-pound gorilla. So let's turn to the third B, which is the variety problem. <clears throat> so what do you have to do uh, if you want to put multiple data sources together? So take the first data source, you've got to extract the data from wherever it is. So you've got to, you've got to parse it into some common representation, get it to where you can work on it. Uh, then invariably, uh, the multiple data sources you are going to be working on, they never have a common <coughs> They're done, they've, they're built by independent people, and so there is no common schema. So if, for example, you're the human resources person uh, in Berlin, and I'm the human resources person in New York, my salaries are in dollars, your salaries are in euros, you've got to transform fields into common representation. Uh, figure that 10% of your data is dirty. So lots of people say put in min minus 99 when what they really mean is null. Uh, so you've got to clean your data up because your data is dirty and the analytics you run on it is not, not going to mean anything. You've got to do schema integration, which is your salary is my wages. You've got to line up the fields correctly. And then uh, there may be dupl duplicates from these various data sources got to do what's called entity consolidation. So I might see Mike Stonebreaker spelled correctly uh, in one data source and MR Stonebreaker spelled incorrectly, which happens a lot uh, in another data source. Are those the same people or are they different people? And then when you get done doing all of this, uh, you, you're going to load this consolidated result into some uh, database system. So I'll call this data curation. And let's first of all figure out why this is hard. So here are three random records that I made up uh, that might come from procurement systems. So I bought $100,000 of widgets from IBM Incorporated. 
from a different data source, I might have bought 800K euros of M dash widgets from IBM SA, which is presumably the Spanish uh, <laughs> the Spanish version of IBM. And then in a third data source, I bought minus 9999 of star with star from 500 Madison Avenue, New York, New York, 10022, which happens to be the intergalactic headquarters of IBM. So one of the problems with putting these three procurement records together, uh, first of all, people are notoriously bad at getting enough metadata to allow you to solve this problem. So you may not know that 800K is in fact in euros, so the units may be missing, and that'll be a big problem. Uh, there's, there's data, which is basically dirty data. Minus 9999 is a code for null, and almost certainly that's not written down any place. Uh, then of course there's just plain dirty data, which is star with star, what it means what. Next slide. Uh, then you have to, once you get done solving all that stuff, you've got to translate uh, disparate currencies into a common format. And then the, the killer is usually entity resolution. Is IBM SA the same as IBM Incorporated? Is IBM Incorporated the same thing as the address 500 Madison Avenue, and so forth and so on? And then are M widgets the same thing as as widgets, uh, so you got to solve all this stuff. So, and this is, you know, you can you can intuitively appreciate that this is tough stuff. Now, I just want to uh, whine about data lakes for a minute. So, the big deal in the Hadoop world these days is data lakes. So, use your Hadoop system as a data lake. So the thinking goes, just put all of your data together into a common place, into a data lake, and life will be great. Uh, that's patently ridiculous. Uh, because the data lake solves only the extract piece of the, what was on the previous slide. All the rest of the stuff remains to be done. And extraction is the easiest of these issues that I went through of cleaning, transformation, entity resolution, and so forth. So if you think that a data lake is going to be a data lake just by doing extraction into a common place, you're really pretty few foolish. What you're going to create is a data swamp and certainly not a data lake. So let's continue with what's the traditional wisdom for how to solve this problem. Well, the extract, transform, and load guys, uh, Informatica is certainly in this, in this market. Uh, IBM has a product in this market called Information Integrator. Uh, and there are a couple of open source products from people like Talent. So the way the traditional wisdom goes is that you have a very smart human to find a global schema up front. So before you do anything, you get the target to which you're going to integrate to. <laughs> then you assign a programmer for each data source. He goes out, finds the owner of the data source, figures out uh, what, what's there and how it's <coughs> encoded, and he writes an extractor, and he then writes a local to global mapping. So the local schema, it's his job to map it to the global schema, which was predefined. He deals with the cleaning routines, the transformation routines, <coughs> and sets up a pipeline to run this extract transform. So this has been used for 20 years uh, in essentially this methodology. And I've asked a lot of people how many data sources they are integrating into this global schema. And usually I get an answer of less than 10. And so I will, if I will, you know, if you twist my arm, you can, you can say 25 or at, at your wildest imagination, you can scale ETL to maybe 50 data sources. So 
the ETL that goes into a data warehouse uh, is typically on a relatively modest number of sources. Now, if you ask the question, how many operational data systems does the average enterprise have? Well, I asked the question to the FedEx guys, the parcel delivery guys, about five years ago, and they said 5,000. Uh, my friend it, it just retired. Uh, as the uh, chief scientist at Verizon, Verizon has 10,000 operational <coughs> data sources. So 10 or 15 go into your data warehouse, the remaining 4,990 just fall on the floor as silence. Next slide. So you might ask the question, why are there so many of these things? Uh, the answer is enterprises uh, organized into business units which are typically independent so that they can get the job done and so they set up whatever data systems they need to make their business unit work uh, and so agility in, uh, in business uh, you know, execution uh, typically is solved by uh, dividing into independent business units which have their own data systems and I was on the Technical Advisory Committee of Citibank uh, a while ago, and it had hundreds of data stores, uh, just hundreds and hundreds. Uh, and this is all because it had independent business units. So, next slide. Uh, second reason why there are so many data systems is uh, enterprises buy other enterprises on a routine basis and when you buy somebody, it comes with a bunch of its own silos. And often, uh, it comes with application logic about customer contracts, uh, contracts for dealing with employees, retirees, and so forth. So when you acquire a company, stamping out the silos of the acquiree is really difficult, and they tend to persist. So there are lots and lots of these silos and only a few of them go into uh, your data warehouse. Uh, next slide. Also, the thing for you to clearly realize is there are no global data models. Uh, business units are independent, and they're independent for agility reasons, which means there are not global customer IDs, global product IDs. Uh, and what's more, one of the favorite topics about 15 years ago was for an enterprise to say, boy, we've got a lot of silos. Let's build a corporate-wide uh, global data model. So they send you know, half a dozen smart folks off to uh, engage in this multi-year exercise of trying to create a global data model. And because business conditions change, uh, that whatever that team comes up with is out of date on day one of the project, let alone at the proposed completion date. So every such uh, global data model project that I've ever seen has failed. So people have built global data models in very narrow domains, like customer-facing data only, from 10 data sources. And that's what uh, realistically is what warehouses you can always say, well, why don't, why don't we just have standards? And standards are a great idea. They're the opposite of business agility. And you've got to form a, you know, an interesting uh, trade-off between business agility and standards. Now, companies have tried to, to generate standards for years and years and years. Every enterprise I know of has tried for a decade to stamp out multiple database systems and only use Oracle. And that's invariably failed. And uh, it's just really difficult to execute, even uh, if you're willing to pay the agility uh, cost of doing it. So a fact of life is that there are lots of these silos. Next slide. So. A big deal these days is, is to integrate those silos after the fact. Why do people want to do it? 
Well, I, I got to give a talk at General Electric a while ago, and one of the things they invariably asked for is to say, I'm the jet engine guy. Uh, I'm trying to sell to customer XYZ. Does any other business unit in uh, GE have a relationship with XYZ? So cross selling is a big deal. Uh, <coughs> Taylor, which is a company I'll talk about in a minute, uh, has, has a contract with uh, GE right now. GE has 325 procurement systems. So if you want to buy paper clips from, say, Staples, you go to your, your division's procurement system, and the next division has a different procurement system. So the CFO had a great idea and said, well, uh, we are we are probably have 325 separate contracts with Staples. I wonder if the terms and conditions, and especially the price, differs uh, among these 325 contracts. The answer is it differs by a huge amount. If GE could get from every, if, if they could just do the following, when a contract comes up for renewal from one of these procurement uh, systems, if that procurement guy could find out what the other 324 procurement officers had managed to negotiate and just demand the most favored nation pricing. So if you could just do that, GE would save $100 million a year. Uh, and that's certainly a lot better than a kick in the pants. Uh, in a couple of slides, I'll talk about a uh, social networking uh, application uh, that Novartis is working on. And so uh, social networking means you want to figure out which employees are working on the same kind of stuff. Uh, better corporate information. So for example, a decade ago, I worked briefly for a company called Informix. A new CEO uh, came on the scene at the first staff meeting he turned to the human resources vice president and said, how many employees do we have? Uh, the human resources person said, I don't know, but I'll find out. I'll come back next week. Roll forward seven days, he asked the same question. Uh, the HR person says, I don't know, and there is no way of finding out. The reason is Informix operated in 58 countries with all with different labor laws, different definitions of what's an employee and what's a contractor, what's full-time, what's part-time. Uh, in order to get the answer to that question, you would have to integrate uh, 58 silos, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the current situation <laughs> is enterprises want to integrate more and more data sources. So here's an example from Novartis. Uh, Novartis has a traditional data warehouse of customer-facing data, but they have about 10,000 scientists doing wet biology and chemistry. <coughs> and think of them as writing uh, experimental results in the electronic lab notebooks. Think 10,000 spreadsheets. There's no standard ontology. There's no standard vocabulary. Uh, they don't even require scientists to record stuff in English since some of the scientists are in Basel, Switzerland and are doing their thing in German. Uh, there's no standard units. Units may not even be recorded. Novartis wants to put together 10,000 spreadsheets. The reason they want to do it is to identify scientists around the world who are either working on the same stuff or uh, using the same reagents to try and produce something so that they could collaborate. Uh, and just basically, they want to put this stuff together for social networking reasons at scale 10,000. And ETL is simply so far away from uh, what would work that they sort of just giggle when you say, why don't you try ETL? Uh, here's just another quick example. Uh, there's a web aggregator uh, that I'm aware that I'm used to work with, 
they are uh, aggregating uh, events, uh, things like rock concerts, uh, uh, you know, political speeches, and things to do, things like hot air ballooning, chocolate tours. They are currently aggregating 80,000 uh, URLs, uh, and they have all the standard headaches of trying to put together 80,000 data sources at this scale. Again, ETL is laughable. Next slide. Uh, traditional ETL simply will not scale to these kinds of numbers. There is too much manual effort to send a programmer out to uh, look at each site. There is no upfront global model. You have no chance of doing that. Uh, traditional ETL is just way too heavy. There's also a big personnel mismatch. Because remember, you're sending out a trained programmer to do data cleaning. Well, are widgets the same thing as M widgets? Well, the programmer has no clue. The only person who knows is a business expert, and he's not the ETL guy. So you've got a personnel mismatch to uh, do uh, help out with the cleaning process. So in my opinion, next slide, doing data integration at scale is a very, very, very big deal. And it's the biggest problem facing many, many enterprises. So to me, this is the 800-pound gorilla in the corner. Uh, and to me, is the thing that we all ought to be uh, focused on. Uh, and just to give one last application that's uh, a European application, uh, Toyota, the car guys, operate in you know 20 odd countries in Europe. Uh, it turns out that they have an independent uh, customer uh, customer uh, data system in every country. In fact, in Germany, they it's even finer granularity than that. Uh, Toyota is organized uh, by by districts. So Toyota wants to put together uh, customer systems uh, in all of these countries. They're all in different languages. There's no, uh, you know, there's no global customer ID, and they want to do this because if Andreas decides to move to Greece because it's cheaper, uh, they want to be able to uh, follow his car from Germany to Greece. So a huge deal to do this at scale. So to achieve scalability, if, if you start thinking, I want to do data integration at scale 10,000 or, or 100,000, you've got to pick all the low-hanging fruit automatically using machine learning and statistics. There's never an upfront global schema. You've got to build it bottom up as you go along. Uh, it doesn't exist upfront, top down. And you've got to involve humans and they've got to be uh, business experts to help with the cleaning because uh, they're the only ones who are going to know whether M widgets and widgets are the same thing. Well, we, we built a, a system along these lines called Data Tamer uh, three years ago. Uh, it was in the CIDR proceedings. Uh, this turned into a commercial company and we're out trying to solve these problems. So just a couple quick slides on how Tamer works. Uh, next slide on schema integration. You've just got to start integrating data sources. There's no upfront, upfront global schema. Uh, you just start putting data, uh, data together. You can use table names. You can use column names. You can know, know about synonyms. You can ask people about synonyms. There may be authoritative data sources. Uh, the first couple of sources may require a substantial amount of help from human experts, but over time the system learns and gets better and better and better. So of the 10,000 uh, data sources from uh, Novartis, uh, Tamer can find about 95%, can match up about 95% of them with no human involvement after some initial training. Uh, you've got to ask a human because uh, ICU-50 is a genetics term. ICE 
E50 is another genetics term. Are they the same, same genetics term or different terms? No programmer is going to know the answer to that. You've got to ask a scientist. So you need an expert sourcing system. And I don't mean anything like Mechanical Turk. Mechanical Turk organizes housewives from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. You, this is experts inside your corporation who are the ones capable of answering these kinds of questions. You need to organize your experts into a hierarchy. The smartest person on genetics happens to be a guy named Wolfgang, who's in Basel, Switzerland. The ultimate arbiter of what's different and what's the same is Wolfgang. But you clearly can't uh, ask all questions, send all questions to Wolfgang. You need a hierarchy, and uh, you've got to uh, have a marketplace to perform load balancing. Uh, as you ask people questions, if you ask a question to somebody, you always want to ask the same question to somebody who's allegedly smarter. You can compare their answers and adjust the expertness of your experts. And all of this works well at scale. Uh, no Barbara is using it. The biggest problem they have is getting the experts to participate. The reason is that uh, the, ten, the project put the 10,000 data sources together is coming from IT, and the scientists don't report to IT. The least common ancestor of IT and the 10,000 scientists is the president of the company. So uh, bribing the scientists to participate is their biggest challenge. Uh, ultimately, entity consolidation turns out to be uh, just about the biggest issue, which is, is MR Stonebreaker misspelled the same as Mike Stonebreaker? Uh, you've got lots and lots of attribute data. Ultimately, this is a clustering problem in a high-dimensional space. Uh, you have, you know, the way Tamer works is that you've got to accept some of the decisions automatically. If you, if you require a human to review everything, which is typical in the medical uh, domain, then it's going to cost you a lot of money with human, ch human checking. Uh, if you accept a lot of stuff, you're going to make some errors. So this is a threshold adjustment issue, and it's a cost versus accuracy trade-off. Uh, you are never going to get uh, you know, 100% accuracy out of it. Uh, so there's a bunch of interesting, this is on the next slide, there are a bunch of interesting startups in this space. Uh, check out the ones on this slide. Uh, they're doing interesting stuff. But mostly I'm here to say uh, this, this is an 800 pound gorilla. It's killing everybody. So if you have a good idea, uh, please start working on it. And I only have one plea, which is uh, there are a bunch of uh, database folks who, who've written cleaning algorithms, and mostly they try out their cleaning algorithms on data that they've, on artificial data that they've injected faults into. And if they inject the faults into the, their data, then it's no surprise that they can find what they injected. So please, 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 find some real data, find, 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 find a real world customer with an integration problem, and try and solve his or her real problem. So please don't work with artificial data. And then if you are an enterprise, I have one plea for you, which is, uh, I keep asking people, if you want to clean your data, the cheapest, cheapest possible way to do it is at the time it enters your system. Because then it's fresh. Whoever's entering it is the person who knows it the best. Why don't you clean it at data entry time and not five years later when you try and put it into an integration system? Uh, otherwise, uh, if you don't clean it uh, at origination, then data integration is going to continue to be uh, the 800-pound gorilla in the corner uh, indefinitely. Uh, that's the end of my slide. Uh, I hope.
hope I hope I made some people mad by now, or more that we run out of time. Either one. Thank you very much, Mike, for this very nice presentation.